Everything you do from then on is different. One of the detectives, I think his name was He was Derek. a golden boy. And all we can do right now is come Extreme together. Extreme domestic violence, multiple rapes. It's so glad to have you with us on Life Support. And I am joined by a very special guest, and his name is Dan Munson. He's the co-founder of Family Innovations. He's a therapist and pastor with a really wide-ranging experience in the church. Dan, thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you. Uh, you not only have wide-ranging experience in the church, you've got a wide-ranging experience personally with a lot of stuff that I'm sure has really kind of given you a foundation for ministry and formed a lot of your worldview about how you deal with pastors and help them and so forth. Tell me a little bit about your story and, and, and what has brought you to this point today. Yeah, thanks, Paul. It's good to be with you. Um, yeah, you know, it started for me, I actually grew up on the farm, southeast Iowa, and so I was going to be a farmer. But um, my folks said, you you should go to college for at least a semester while you farm. And so I ended up going to college, Iowa Wesleyan College in, in southeast Iowa, Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and uh, majored in religion. And my instructor said, why don't you become a pastor? And so I got interested in a different harvest field. Mm -hmm. Instead of the grain on the farm, I got into the harvest of souls. And so I went to seminary, Bethel Seminary, 1975 to 1978. So that dates me there. But so I've been 42 years in, in ministry. But while there, met my wife while I was in seminary had, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, we got married in 1977. And I graduated in 1978. So we started out thinking, hey, this is just going to be clear sailing. It's going to be a lot of fun doing ministry, new marriage and everything. And and we got into the church, uh, two church parish down in Iowa, and uh, it was going um, okay. But uh, it wasn't long until, you know, we were having some infertility kinds of issues, and we were struggling with that, uh, people having babies in the church, and that was hard for my wife and for myself, so we got some counseling. So then we thought, well, let's get into foster care. So we got our foster care license and received a sibling set, a six and eight year old brother, sister. And there'd been a lot of you know uh, biological uh, issues there with alcohol, with the parents and abuse and sexual abuse, even with the, the daughter from dad and just a lot of different things there. Very difficult. Well, then we started having some struggles with uh, with the church. We were starting to have you know people not thinking we were meeting their expectations. My wife's infertility stuff didn't seem to be any better in terms of how she felt about herself, even though we had some foster kids in in the home. They were getting counseling. They were having lots of issues. So then we thought, well, let's adopt some kids too. So we <laughs> adopted a, a little girl from uh, Korea, three months old, and the next year adopted a little boy from Korea. And then the next year after that, we were pregnant with our biological oh, wow. Amy. So, mm -hmm. well, that though, Paul, put the, that's a lot of stuff in five years. Yeah. And and with the church stuff and with all of that, our family was in counseling, and and so that was uh, and my wife was struggling also with just different anxiety issues and things that were very tough to to handle. And the problem for me was I was just a workaholic at that time. I was trying to, you know, fix everybody. Uh, trying to fix my family, trying to fix the church people, uh, trying to bring people to Jesus. It was two different churches, and they were struggling. And I didn't realize that I was um, not being who I needed to be to my family. I was getting my needs met through my work, getting my acceptance needs through my preaching, my teaching, what I was doing for others. And that created a need then for our family to get counseling. And later on, after 24 years of ministry, that's the reason family innovations exist partly, <laughs> mostly mm -hmm. probably, because of my family and the kind of difficulties that, that we experienced. And I found help in counseling and found that we could help others by starting a counseling uh, organization called Family Innovations. So that's a little bit of that. So Good for you. It's really difficult as a pastor to juggle those uh, two things, home work, ministry, because it is true that ministry doesn't stop. I also think that we use it as a crutch yeah. because you can actually disengage if you really want to. But um, there's so much pressure on pastors from boards, uh, from their own conscience. You know, it, nobody wants to, to un, you know, at least for me, I don't want to short sell the, the congregation. You know, they're paying my salary. They expect me to work. Uh, but... That's a very, very uh, thin line 
because my family, biblically, is my number one ministry. And it's, it's, it's just really hard to juggle at times. Exactly right. And that's what I had to learn, Paul. And I learned the hard way because it, it was easier when I had, you know, all the family stuff starting to happen, five kids, different things going on, and all the different things that the, the adopted kids were having struggles with and the things that, you know, the foster kids were having problems with. And I found it really easy just to get my needs met uh, away from the home with the church family. But I went to a seminar, and I heard uh, Chuck Swindoll, actually. I heard him give a talk. I've heard of him. You've heard of him, yes. Yes, I have. And his talk uh, was to pastors, and he said, why don't you leave the bride of Christ alone and spend some time with your own bride? <laughs> wow. That hit home, and that began to get myself some help, because I got some help through Larry Crabb, another old name that you probably know. I love Larry Crabb. Yeah, uh, and, and had some individual counseling with him, and then got some exchange life kinds of counseling, or victorious Christian life counseling, and I began back in the 1980s to get my life turned around where I began to understand, you know, my sin of getting my needs met apart from Jesus. I was not trusting Jesus. I was working for Jesus. I was doing his, his work in his church, I thought, but really it was for me. It was for me to get my needs met, to get my acceptance needs met. And finally, what I had to do, Paul, was repent that, you know what, I am trying to get my needs met and my security needs met and my acceptance needs met through what I do rather than through who I am. And then how did that change your ministry? Just turned it upside down for me because I, I realized that everything I was doing, it was to get something back. And I thought I was just doing it for Jesus, and I thought I was mm -hmm. doing it for, you know, mm -hmm. the right reasons. My family had been telling me that I was spending way too much time with work and that I was putting it ahead of the family. But I, I discounted that at first, thinking, wait a minute, they're kind of against me too. Right. You know, they're, they're against... Uh, they, they don't against, understand. They don't understand. They don't understand. Are they against right. Jesus? You know, I'm right. working for Jesus, you know. And, right. And finally, uh, it, it hit home through counseling and through the Holy Spirit getting a hold of me that, Dan, you have an idol. You know, your work is your idol. You're, you're not trusting me for your security. I just had head knowledge, Paul. I had the theolo theology. I had the positional truths down. I was preaching them and teaching them. I had not a clue experientially what that was about. I had not a clue what that was uh, about in terms of me actually uh, mm. communion, having a communion time with, with God, with the Holy Spirit. That's what started then. I started the communion piece of the Holy Spirit. I got my heart involved instead of just my head involved. Well, that sounds way too radical for uh, <laughs> pastors. And young pastors, please listen to this because I know that you feel as if you have to perform and you have to make your mark and you have to you know, be builders and so forth. But listen to what Dan's saying, because your ministry is going to go as far as your character. And you may be the most talented young man or young woman around. You may be a fantastic preacher and great with people, and you might be really innovative. But if your character is not developed, then some of the things that Dan described are going to start uh, rearing their ugly heads. And unfortunately, you know this, Dan, that a lot of, a lot of pastors don't make it. That's because right. Right. because those are really serious life trip ups that can cost a ministry. So what do you tell young pastors when they're when they're just starting out and they're entering into ministry? They don't teach this stuff in seminary. Seminaries are getting better. They're starting to teach more practical life skills and so forth. But back in the day, it was basically doctrine, how to preach, how to how to how to how to, right? That's right. Yeah. So how do you what do you tell young pastors to try to not get this uh, problem to, to rear its ugly head in their church? Yeah, I've started asking pastors, uh, you, know, you know, what is your motivation, you know, for what you do? You know, uh, and they'll say, well, my motivation is the Bible. It's, uh, it's from the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been trusting God. I've just read a new book uh, on how to do it, and uh, the Scripture is speaking to me on how to do it. Um, and I said, well, that all sounds great. But, you know, what's the motivation? What are you getting out of it? You know, what, what's, uh, well, I, I get my needs met, and I feel good about it. 
and I feel like that I'm, um, you know, contributing to society and contributing to God's work. But I said, well, then maybe just keep doing what you're doing. Is it working? And usually when they're in my office, it's not working. Yeah, right. You know, right. And and they'll say, well, no, that's the reason I'm here. I'm here to, uh, mm-hmm. to uh, get some answers for you because I think I just need to tweak some things. I think I just need to do things a little better, maybe a little smarter. I said, well, thank you for what you've just shared because what I have to share with you may sound kind of counterintuitive, but what I have to share with you is that there's a great possibility that your needs are getting met apart from God, even though you're doing work for God and you're busy in his kingdom work. It's possible that that's where your your needs are being met through what you're doing instead of who you are as a person that God loves. And oftentimes they start to cry. Hmm. Or they say, how did you know? (laughs) Or that's exactly right. And they'll say something like, you know, I've been preaching it for years. And, I, and it's, that's what's so frustrating is that I'm preaching it. And even some of the congregations seem to be catching on to it. But I'm not really feeling it personally. Wow. That, and that's a powerful moment because instinctively they knew you were right. Yeah. I, I just read a blog that talked about how pastors are in a line of work where you can either hide uh, laziness or you can hide uh, workaholism because of the structure that churches are. And when you put it that way, the way you just did, it's convicting for everyone, whether you're a pastor or not, because this is a, an idol. We're, we're idol worshipers. That's that's the garden problem. Exactly And right. if you want to talk about Larry Cribe, you can you know pick up Silence of Adam. It's still a book worth reading, in my opinion. But yep. um, And pastors are just as susceptible to anyone else, just different idols. It's different idols. Clean idols, maybe acceptable <laughs> idols, yeah. right? That's exactly right, Paul. And what I what I talk about at that point is is the the false self versus the 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 true self. And and pastors say, well, you know, say more about that. And I say, well, the false self, uh, you know, that's really the flesh, where we're trying to get our security needs and our acceptance needs um, from what we do and from our abilities and from our programming and from our preaching and teaching and the number of people that we have, the number of dollars we're bringing in, and all of that. And uh, that is is a false identity, which is not going to make it when all of a sudden we don't have the numbers. All of a sudden, COVID hits. <laughs> yeah, know? boy, that changed a lot of things real quick. Real quick, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and when that hit, then that's caused the conversation with pastors to get real serious with me when they call. Because now... They don't have this pulpit to stand in front of and all these people. They've got this online, and it's different. They're not getting the same vibes from it. Uh, some For some, the, the finances aren't there. The numbers aren't there. They're wondering if their people are now going to other churches that are doing it better. They, they just don't know what's happening to their congregation. Uh, they're um, taking it out sometimes on their family and on their, on their spouses. And some of them are just saying, help. You know, we're, we're, now we've got to be the parent, uh, uh, not only the parent, but they're the parent, but I mean, they've got to be the teacher of their kids, and they've got to be the recreation person because it's, there's no sports. There's, right, yeah, it's, and, it's and, hard. And they're trying to work at home, and the spouse is trying to work at home. And, and so what I've been able to say, Paul, in the midst of all this uh, COVID-19 pandemic is that there's a silver lining in it. The silver lining in it is that it has slowed the whole world, think about it, the whole world down. It's shifted so many things. All the nailed down things of life are beginning to fall apart, all of them in some people's lives. Finances and jobs and how we do things and where we get our identity from. It's all just shifting. And then I'll say to the, to the person that I'm sharing with, what do you think the good news could be in this in terms of our identity in Jesus or getting to know Jesus better. And it's usually a pause just like that, a silence. And they say, you know, for the first time in a long time, I've been doing some abiding in the Word. Mm-hmm. I've been spending some time in meditation upon the Word. I've been having time to pray. And that's a new thing for some of these pastors. You wouldn't think it would be a new thing for pastors, Paul. 
But so many of them are saying to me, I've been too busy yeah. to do what I've been preaching everyone else should be doing. I've been too busy to do it. And that's been, a, I've just heard that many times lately, Paul. Yeah, that's really good. And we're going to be together next time as well. We'll de- we'll delve more into the pandemic and how it's affecting churches and pastors and mental health and so forth. But, you know, I'm kind of a governance guru, and um, I enjoy dealing with churches and church consults and so forth. So I want to talk to board members for a moment now, you who are overseeing pastors. Um, I'm just going to just say it right out. Pastors live in fear of their boards. Um a lot of this comes from expectations that are unfair, that are at least they perceive are on them, and it may not be true, but they perceive that the board's per- perception of them is that they perform. And unfortunately, what boards measure is money and people in the seats far too often and the behavior of the family of the pastor, et cetera, et cetera. And so my hope is that board members would begin to look at that pastor sitting there as a broken human being that needs to be encouraged, that needs to know that uh, you're in his or her corner, that you're there not to be a checks and balances board, but a board that is there to be a team member with that pastor to move the church forward. Because here's what I'm afraid of, Dan. I'm afraid of when this, if this COVID-19 thing ends, and I'm assuming that'll be when there's a vaccine or some unofficial moment when we all kind of take a deep breath. I'm worried about what's going to happen because I think pastors are barely holding it together right now. I think uh, church boards have, have, just like everybody else, disconnected from church. And so they're, they're, even those relationships are artificial. They're over Zoom um, and so forth. So I guess what I want to ask you is if you are leading a church as a ministry leader, a board member, or a pastor right now in this pandemic, um, what's the best way to keep yourself uh, from from really running into a problem when it's over? Yeah. Because it's going to, we're going to have a slingshot effect. We've all adjusted to this new thing, and now we're going to have to adjust to another new thing. Really good question. I've been thinking about that uh, for myself as well and with other pastors and people I've been talking with. And and what I've come to, Paul, is that prayerfully during this pandemic, they we're actually getting to know Jesus and the Holy Spirit in a way that is not just communication like praying or reading the Bible, but is is actually communion, that where there's actually listening going on. To where rather than me speaking to God or me initiating programs for God, it's me and other pastors listening to God, hearing his voice, being so familiar with his voice that when he calls our name, that we actually hear the voice of God. And sometimes we call it practicing the presence of Jesus and not initiating so much in terms of programs, but resting. That's a new word for a lot of pastors, resting, because it sounds like passivity. It sounds, sounds like, like laziness. Laziness. Mm-hmm. It sounds like uh, we're not doing our part. It sounds like that we're letting God down, right? Resting comes from listening to God. And that resting means his peace has overwhelmed us. His peace takes over. The joy of the Lord rises up from within us when we're resting. And then guess what happens? That's not passivity. All of a sudden now it's God's joy and God's grace and God's power flowing through our bodies, Paul, as instruments of God. And it becomes the most aggressive thing we can do, but we have to become broken. We have to come to the end of our doing, Mm. our Martha, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and be a Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus, even though that it seems irresponsible. Martha even said, get in here and help me in the kitchen. You know, Jesus, tell her to get in the kitchen and help me, you know? Right. And Jesus said, no, Martha, Mary's doing the the bigger thing. Right. The best thing. Right. And, And I pray that that's what will happen for us as we return from COVID, that it won't be for not, 
I and, hope not too, and I'm yeah. afraid that's going to be the temptation is to yeah. just slingshot right back into the way our lives were. And I do, I would say this too to fellow pastors: there may be not a lot of energy in the tank, and so you may not be able to, you know, uh, sit for hours and hours and pray. But whatever time that you can um, carve out for yourself, God will use that time wisely. And uh, here's what I've learned: this is a simple thing. You know, and we just started coming back to the office, and I was home for a long time. And I would just say, I'm tired. I'm going to go lay down. I've never done that before, probably for 25 or 30 years. Yeah, good for you, Paul. Yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> wow, you can do this. You can do this. Give you know? yourself permission to right. do that. Yeah. Right. And then you're better. Then everybody's better off. Your wife's better off. Your yeah. kids are better off. And your church is better off. Because here's the thing I think that, you know, we all think the church needs us at high, you know, um, high volume, well tanned, well, you know, uh, what they really need is a man or woman who's broken. Yep. Because our brokenness then will allow them to become broken because they'll watch us. And w- what we talk about will be different. How we see the world will be different, right? Absolutely right. The fact that you give yourself that permission now, Paul, is so big. And, and you have to ask yourself, why couldn't I do that before? You know, and so often it's because we thought that we were indispensable you know we thought that we had to be on all the time we had to do that why for me paul so often it was because that's how i got my needs met in terms of acceptance and feeling like that i mattered and jesus says dan you matter go take a nap (laughs) yeah i don't like this conversation because now i'm starting to get convicted (laughs) but i want to talk to you about it more next time because um with all of this that we're talking about mental health is an issue and this is something else that ministry workers don't do well with. And I know that you deal with people that are struggling with mental health, and you've had that to deal with that in your own family as well. So we'll look forward to having you back again. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it so much. Thanks, Paul. Good to be with you. Thanks. Thanks.